Hello and welcome to Murder with Friends, the show where friends get together and talk about some of the darker sides of history. I'm your host, Grace Baldridge, and joining me on today's episode is a returning favorite of mine, Cecilia Betzel. Welcome back to Hello. the Murder with Friends studio. <laughs> yes, we got a mere applausing behind. <laughs> <laughs> um, so welcome back. I'm really excited to have you. Last time we talked about Eileen Warnos. Yes. But before we decided on talking about Eileen Warnos, we were talking about um, other uh, figures in history that we were fascinated with. And one mm -hmm. that came up with you was Elizabeth Bathory. And I'm wondering why were you interested in Elizabeth Bathory or what, what was your fascination with her? Well, clearly I'm just fascinated by female ser serial killers. I was gonna, <laughs> if you like one, you like more than one. Yeah, I am murder with friends resident female serial killer expert, <laughs> <Yeah>. guys. <laughs> um, well, one of my favorite books is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Mm -hmm. So I remember after reading that, I started doing a bunch of research on Vlad Tepes. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you know, when you're on that Wikipedia like hole, I started reading about her. The Blood Countess. The Blood Countess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I guess just because there's so much mystery surrounding her, so uh, I guess just to break down who Elizabeth Bathory is and who we're going to be discussing today, she is known as the Blood Countess. There are a lot of names, or the Bloody Countess. Yeah. Um, she was a, uh, as, well, she holds the record in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most prolific female serial killer in history. She is accused to have killed up to 650 girls in 16th century Hungary. She operated between the dates of uh, 1584 and 1609, this is what they are saying. Uh, and she was, well, there's a lot to talk about here. And there's she was imprisoned for her crimes uh, from 1610 to, to 1614. 1614. And she was kept in a tower with all the windows walled up um, where she met yep. her demise. There was like two rooms or something and she lived there for four years before she died. And uh, I guess the reason why she's called the Bloody Countess is because all the stories against her say that she uh, bathed in the blood of young girls because she wanted to have eternal youth. She thought that the blood of young girls yeah. uh, would keep her young and keep her skin looking nice. But disclaimer, that came about much later. There's no actual accusation at the time or testimony or anything of her doing that. Or was there? Or <laughs> So All like, right. where did it come from? I don't know. Well, but. <laughs> let's let's throw to our first clip of exactly who we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> this is Elizabeth Bathory. According to the record books, Elizabeth Bathory is the most prolific female killer ever, ordering the deaths of over 600 young women. She will also go down in legend as Countess Dracula, a vampire who bathed in the blood of virgins to stay forever young. So where's the evidence for these incredible stories? Or is this just a bloody tale? Is it just a bloody tale? That's what we're gonna be talking about today. But yeah. first, let's talk about 16th century Hungary where Elizabeth was born in 1560. Mm -hmm. She was born into one of the most powerful and wealthiest families in Hungary. Um, and she uh, was richer actually than the King of Hungary himself. Not yeah. she, but her family, the Bathory family. Uh, she was raised Calvinist and she was highly educated. And I think yeah. that's important to her story. She was able to read and write in four different languages, including mm -hmm. uh, the language of the peasants. Um, she was also able to speak Greek. I just This is unusual for yeah. a girl at the time, that her family really took it upon themselves to make sure she was so well educated and also that she took to being educated. She was yeah. interested in that. She was never just, uh, well, I mean, who, who's to know, but she never really was very interested in only being yeah. a wife. And they said that she was sort of a tomboy. Mm -hmm. She, you know, fenced and knew how to fight. Big horseback rider. And let's talk a little <laughs> bit about the, the political climate of the time that she was born into. Yes. Because very, it was a very volatile time. tumultuous. Mm -hmm. So there, at the time, there's a huge war throughout her entire life it was happening uh, between the Ottoman Empire and Hungary. Mm -hmm. So sort of this like upsurge of Muslim yeah. faith. And then the sort of Catholic and Protestant Yeah, because the, the king of Hungary was still Catholic and that was yeah. still part of the Roman Catholic Roman Empire. Right. Empire. But then there was a movement in Hungary more towards Protestant, Lutheran. Uh, like I said, she was raised Calvinist. She was born to a Calvinist family. And so there, there's sort of a, there, Hungary is a country on the verge right now. Yeah. And we're not really sure which direction it's going to go in when she's brought into this. And so mm -hmm. she is raised with so much uncertainty and a lot of violence. And I actually want to go to a clip right now that outlines what was going on in 16th century Hungary. At the time of Elizabeth's birth, Hungary was ruled by Austria to its west, 
and as a Christian country, it was involved in an ongoing war against the Turkish Muslims to the south. The country was almost permanently at war during Elizabeth's lifetime. Hungary was politically a very important place in those times because it was the bulwark of Christian Europe against the Turkish invasion, which really threatened to overwhelm the whole of Christian Europe. One can imagine societies in which there were mutilated soldiers, beggars who come back from the wars with nothing, bereaved women because their families were being killed at the front. It was a very traumatized society. There was also a very, very savage battle going on, slightly under the surface in Hungarian society, between the Hungarians and the Austrians, who were always vying for power and territory in the empire, and also between the great Hungarian families themselves. Even each village was divided, in some cases, between Hungarians and Croatians and Slovaks who despised each other. So I think we need to talk about how powerful being Hungarian nobility made Elizabeth Bathory. Yeah. Because the, the power dynamics in 16th century Hungary are terrifying. Super happy I don't live <laughs> there right now. Yeah. Because if you were a peasant... You were essentially you were, a serf. Yes. Slave. Yeah, I would say it does sound like a form of slavery. So yeah. they were at basically the beck and call at the mercy of people that were just born into yeah. nobility. Yeah, they basically owned the people that lived in their land. But to my understanding is that they owned the people in the sense that if they wanted a person to come serve at the castle or if they wanted a person or a group of people to do X task, like build this mm -hmm. castle, they had to drop everything and do that. Is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Right. And also it's important that we note that people were dying all the time, whether it was from war yeah. or diseases, and the peasants it's just sort of- It's a dark time for Europe. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a reason why they say, you know, don't get medieval. Because uh -huh. the, the, all the, the methods that are being used here, whether it's for uh, health and wellness, you know, the yeah. uh, medical procedures at the time. Were or, horrific. Or the torture or the disciplinarian. Yeah. I just um, think there was a lot of fear. A lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty and there mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of communication in between um, the different villages with regards to what was going on. Your connection to the world was from your nobility and what uh, the lords over you were telling you. Yeah. Um, so it was in, I would say, probably uh, the best interest of someone like Elizabeth Bathory um, and these powerful families to sort of keep the serfs dumb. Yeah. And you, you didn't want them to be very educated. You didn't you want, want them to be able to communicate. And you want to rule with fear. Yeah, and at the age of 11, the, the old age of 11, <sighs> Elizabeth Bathory is, uh, I guess, one, I want to say scheduled to be married. Because, engaged, yeah. Yeah, she's engaged. <laughs> but it doesn't really feel like, it's not the engagement the way that we understand yeah. it. And, and at that time, if you were engaged, it meant that you would go and live with your fiancé's family. And she was engaged to marry uh, Ferenc Nadazdi, and he was a very uh, powerful um, Hungarian nobility, but not... She was more powerful. Yeah, she, <laughs> he was, I was gonna say, I read some articles that said that they were of equal status. From what I have understood, it seems like she actually did outrank him a bit, although yeah, he was... she did. She definitely was wealthier than he was. Which um, is why then, when they did get married when she was 15, she kept her own name. Yes, Bathory. she did keep her own name. Bartory. Yes. <laughs> I guess this is now a oh, good yeah, time disclaimer. to disclaimer. We're going to be getting into names and uh, castles and all that uh, interesting stuff, yeah. but we do not speak Hungarian, <clears throat> uh, so please give us a little bit of a break if we're mispronouncing some stuff. We're doing the yeah. best that we can. And on that note, let's go to our yeah. first clip about this marriage Elizabeth Bathory had with Ferenc Nadasdi. One of the most powerful unions in the land, comprising huge estates throughout Hungary. With these estates came control of the surrounding villages, and from these, Elizabeth and Francis selected peasants to work as servants in their manor houses and their castles. At her trial almost 40 years later, Elizabeth would be accused of treating these peasants with extraordinary and excessive cruelty. So, the, the, this clip, the music is quite sinister behind yes. it, but it, actually, from what I've researched, it seems like it was a, a pretty agreeable marriage. Yeah. They seem to have gotten along really well. There <clears> are <throat> um, some indications that maybe she did have an affair while he was away, because... You know, I also heard that she... I heard this from, like, one source, so I don't know if this is just complete lies, but um, I heard that she was raped between that time when she was 11 to 15 at 
her house and had an illegitimate illegitimate child. Well, there I actually also have read that there are, uh, there are a, little, a few discrepancies and some speculation on the number of children yeah. that she had. So she had four kids that survived, and she mm -hmm. really did a decent job uh, at raising these kids. They were raised with a governess, yeah. which is customary of the time, but making sure that especially her daughters were uh, married off into well-to-do families. She really did make sure that her kids um, were not left yeah. stranded because marriage was really a tool of diplomacy at the time. But she and, seemed to be a fairly good wife and mother. Yeah, and all the letters to um, Ference indicate that you know she cared about him and they yeah. corresponded with each other, but he was at war um, or out studying for the majority of the time that they were married. He'd be yeah. gone, I read, 10 out of the 12 months of the year. Yeah. So it wasn't a, a marriage in the sense that we would understand today. Mm -hmm. But very few marriages were. Yeah, it wasn't, it was not at all the same. <laughs> and also an, another thing that we should point out too from that clip, they say that they would uh, select um, kids from the village that they, where the castle was and those kids would come and work for the court. Mm -hmm. That was normal. I think the music behind it, a lot of the clips that I've seen about Elizabeth Bathory <laughs> make it seem very nefarious. Like they would go out in the night and like like a Grinch and yeah. select these kids to come work I heard they court. like lined them up naked and she would be like, that one. Well, I think that, I want her. I think that, that could possibly be true, but it, it Yeah, I mean, as a very, very powerful noble woman, you had a lot of servant girls. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took like what, like five girls to put your dress on in the morning. Well, there's the expression, it literally takes a village. And yeah. <laughs> she presided over villages. It does. It did take a village for her to get ready and for her court to operate. Mm -hmm. um, but it was normal for the peasants whose life, again, was terrible. They were slaves. Yeah. They wanted their kids to maybe work under nobility and learn etiquette. This was not, it, it was wasn't. a good place for them to be. I mean, you essentially at that time uh, had to sell your children. Yeah, and it was either off uh, selling them to marriage mm -hmm. or you know, maybe selling them to the court uh, because the, the girls especially were a commodity. Yeah. Um, and serving under nobility was such an opportunity. And I think it's important to note that Elizabeth Bathory was probably the most powerful female noblewoman in Hungary at the time. Oh, I would I would say by far, like hands down. Mm -hmm. And especially with her marriage to Ferenc, because Ferenc became known as the Black Knight. He was known as just a ruthless fighter. He was a great warrior. Fighter. Yeah, just a great just warrior, great. just super brutal. <laughs> um, and he died in 1604 from, uh, he died in battle, but the, Cause was, like, of it paralyzed. was, yeah. He, they said that his his hands were blue yeah. um, for weeks before he was actually dead. So it seems like he may have died of just a medieval infection, as people did. People yeah, died. No penicillin, of, guys. Yeah, people were dying all the time. Um, so he dies, and then we see that uh, there's a shift in the thinking around Elizabeth, and mm -hmm. there's also uh, a shift in loyalty around her. Yes. Um, it is actually in 16, between 1602 and 1604, a Lutheran minister starts speaking out and accusing her and four co-conspirators, who were her aides, of just brutal murders. Yeah. This All is when word starts to spread. Insane. Yeah, but it was methods. around, notably, the death of her husband. Her husband dies, she's left alone. Again, she now becomes one of the most powerful people in Hungary, and she is a powerful woman in Hungary. Yeah. First of all, um, the king, Matthias II, yes. um, owed her and Nadazdi, who now is dead, a lot of money from the war. So there was a debt there. And then at the same time, when he died, her husband, he um, assigned Georgi Turzo, Turzo yes. um, as her like caretaker. I guess mm -hmm. a woman couldn't, you know, just rule by herself. She had to have a man there with her. Yeah. So he was in charge of her and her children, his heirs. Yeah, and he's also, uh, Georgi Turzo is a pal palatine, which uh, in Hungarian yeah. uh, high society back in those days, that means that he's the highest ranking dignitary in the kingdom of Hungary. And he's also a giant dickwad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that, that is true. So <laughs> around this time, the rumors start to surface. And mm -hmm. I want to toss right now to a clip of what those rumors were. When we talk about Elizabeth Bathory and what she was accused of, this is what we're talking about. We have one intriguing piece of evidence about how the couple, both of them, treated their servants. And it comes in a letter from their local Lutheran minister in 1602 complaining about the brutal treatment of servants by the pair. For um, a minister to have the courage 
to write a letter of protest criticizing the behavior of two such extraordinarily powerful people tells us I think that there was something already by that stage beyond the bounds of normal, acceptable behavior going on in terms of the way these two together treated their servants. Perhaps there is a union there that's incredibly unhealthy. You know, they have the power, they have the money, they have the means, and they've certainly got a lot of very accessible victims to prey on. And all of those things, I think, you know, are really a lethal combination. So now we're hearing about this crazy brutality that she's apparently carrying out against her servants. And notably, it is when uh, she's being accused of doing this to the, the daughters of nobility. That's what really um, gets this investigation going. So she's accused in 1604, but then it's only in 1610 mm -hmm. that King Matthias asks uh, Georgi Terzo to look in on her. Can we talk about some of the rumors? Yes, let's. Let, I think we should, at this point in time, <laughs> we should talk about what was being thrown around. Yeah. What is the, you know, how are these 600 plus girls being killed? There was a lot of mention of needles um, being underneath you know, the fingernails. put underneath fingernails, um, using like white hot iron rods to burn them. Again, the blood stuff. Oh, there's a lot of rumors about um, servant girls being forced to bathe in cold water and then go outside in the snow mm -hmm. until they freeze to death. Mm -hmm. uh, one story I of. heard, uh, I heard that uh, one of her servant girls was caught stealing something. And so uh, Elizabeth took a coin and held it over a flame until it was white hot, until the coin was white, and then pressed it into the girl's hand so it burned But again, through. don't you feel like that's, like I wouldn't be surprised if I read about some medieval noble person doing that to their servant. I think that's a good point to bring up because I do think that a lot of the stories we hear about with Elizabeth Bathory are true. I believe that yeah. coin story. There, that, there's a written account of that. The stories that I don't believe are the ones that we see picked up later in sort of 17th century, mm -hmm. 18th century folklore. One of the ones that stuck with me the most I thought was really scary was um, a lot of, after she ran out of space, you know, to bury these women, there's this uh, rumor that she put them under her bed and would feed them like they were alive. What? <laughs> yeah. That doesn't make sense. Why would she, she feed crazy. them? Well, look, to be fair, there is evidence that she was a little out of her mind when her yeah. husband died in 1604. Um, there are records that indicate that she sort of lost it. And she was you know, supposed to be this high powered diplomat. And when he was alive, when he was away at war, she did, she resolved local disputes. She took yeah. care of the estate. She had to make sure that she could um, stave off attacks from the Ottoman Empire trying to come up. She had huge responsibility over the estates and the castle. And one of my favorite stories is that she um, took care of a lot of destitute women in her villages. And there was one story where she um, helped a woman whose daughter was raped and impregnated. Um, and she did a lot for the community. Yeah, prior to 1602, 1604, a lot of the stories about Elizabeth Bathory are her as kind of a badass bitch yeah. leader, just really doing a great job while her husband she is wasn't, away. She wasn't, she didn't, she wasn't like a soft, cuddly woman. I mean, no. she definitely ruled with an iron fist. But then again, as a powerful woman at the time, you sort of had to. Yeah, I do think that she and her husband were ruthless disciplinarians. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of the um, techniques that she learned to uh, discipline her subordinates were from her husband. Yeah. I think that a lot of her, because he was such a war leader, I think that he saw some brutal stuff and that that was then taught to her or ingrained to her as normal, normal yeah. as like, this is what you do. This is how um, girls should be punished if they, if they don't act the right mm -hmm. way. This is how the world works because at that time that was how her world yeah. worked. But there is a theory, um, I guess she did a lot of um, like medical work. So she was sort of a doctor, an amateur sort of novice physician. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the theories that disprove the fact that she murdered all these girls are saying that she was actually trying to heal them, that they were sick and these methods of torture were actually medieval healing methods. Mm -hmm. So things like the needles was like acupuncture, because you know, they used to bleed people. Right. That was super common. Mm -hmm. Before they knew what germs were, they thought diseases were in the blood. Right. Um, so getting rid of the bad blood. I heard something about her um, pressing stinging nettles all over a girl as a form of torture, but stinging nettles have been used a lot for medical reasons. 
Yeah. So th there's just like a lot of speculation. There is a lot of speculation, but one thing that we do have a record of is that when uh, Georgi Terzo enters into the castle, he writes, first-hand account, he writes that he sees a dead girl, a girl that is wounded, um, that is, um, you know, suffering, and then another girl that is imprisoned for, uh, and, and maybe being tortured later. And so uh, he walks in on this, and uh, quickly everyone is arrested. She is actually never put on trial, yeah. um, but her four co-conspirators are put on trial and they are put to death. Well, here, here's a clip right now of what the fate <laughs> was of the accused. Under torture, four servants admitted being complicit in a prolonged reign of terror. Other witnesses claimed Bartry and co had killed hundreds of young women. Just a week later, at Beechka Castle, the accomplices were tried and executed. Yet Bartry, the boss, never faced trial. So why wasn't she tried? Well, they've had a particularly speedy, helpful conclusion from their point of view. They've got out the evidence, they've found the guilty, they've punished them, they've incarcerated Elizabeth. The show is over. Bartry was locked up for life in her own castle, her land passing to relatives. So that is effectively the end of Elizabeth Bathory's story, as far as we would know for a long time. She was put up in a castle, the walls were bricked up, and she lived there for about four years before she eventually died. And that's... That's really the story that you hear about a lot of times with Elizabeth Bathory. The Blood Countess uh, was uh, put away, and that was the end of that. And boy, aren't we glad that she is dead and gone. <laughs> and I guess now in the second half of this segment, we're going to tell you a couple problems with that story. So stick around. We'll be right back.